Are you feeling like a high energy show today, Matt? Yeah, dude, I'm fired up, bro. Are you fired I up? haven't been any ever better. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. All right, it's Practical Shooting After Dark. We're here to talk about shooting on deck tonight, Mr. Frank Rizzi. How you doing? And, well, Hoppy Cakes, as we call them. The de- <laughs> you <know>. Hi, everybody. <laughs> well, guys, you know the deal. Everybody comes here with a topic, and then we'll... Uh, We'll take a question. So who'd like to go first? I mean, I can. You can. You have a pretty good topic, Matt. Um, I guess. it's So I'm going to talk about how I'm picking and designing the stages for Area 3 for 2022. So we will have 15 stages at Area 3 this year coming up. There'll be five short, five medium, five long. And that's basically to to even out the round count, not make it super crazy and have 15, 32 round stages, test some different skills, different activating sequences, and actually work on the timing of the stages. So they all kind of take the same amount of time to run a bay. So a couple of the bays will be doubled up and then... I'll combine those with short stages each so they get run fast, no moving targets on them. And then, so those would take the same time as a medium field course stage with activating targets on it and like complicated shooting sequences and more positions and stuff like that. And then the larger stages will be not as difficult as the medium stages, but they'll be based around just more round count because everybody likes more rounds, right? Absolutely. Yep. And so... What I decided to do was design at least one stage every day in December. Some days I would design more than one and some days I didn't. I ended up coming out of December with 45 stages designed, around 15 for each size. So I had 15 stages of each size drawn out and put in Google SketchUp. And at that point in January, I went through and kind of tweaked some stages so I had some variations of the existing stages already in there. So I I wound up with over 50 stages and I submitted those to a couple people for feedback. And then once I got that feedback, I went through and reviewed them and started adding no shoots and stuff like that and took the feedback that I got and actually came out of that stage design kind of sprint we'll call it where i did all that i came out and i had nine fully done 100 percent good stages for area three so far those have been vetted by top shooters and other people that about how fun they would be um i mean that's about it at the same time i did some stages for free state i've wound up with five stages for free state that were designed for another local shooter to put on the ground for that. So I wound up with 14 stages out of that kind of two month span that are ready to go. That will be used in major matches this year. All right. Any questions? No, I mean, that sounds like a pretty reasonable process. Yeah. And uh, there's still some more to go. I'm going to probably get some other people to help me with that. Uh, Ask for some other designs because one thing I noticed in one one of the feedback things was a lot of the same type of stages. So they overall, they look the same. Oh, yeah, that was for me, wasn't it? Yeah, that was from you, yeah. So if you look at all 50 or so stages, you can see a pattern develop. And I think that's just kind of human nature. Like you have an idea what you're going to do, and it just kind of filters down into everything. And if you're designing a bunch of stages at the same time, it kind of works its way into every single one of them yeah it's hard to break out of that yeah that's why it's helpful to run it by other people yep so you said you vetted the stages based on how fun they would be i so i didn't just send it to you and kwanzik i sent it to actual like not as high class shooters that just want to go out and have fun and they looked at it and provided feedback also how was that feedback different uh some of the feedback was about the targets that were used, which I I just use one, one common target across the whole thing just for ease of looking at them. 
So I didn't switch up between USPSA and IPSC targets. I just put one target type on there just for the design purposes. I don't plan on sticking to that because some of the feedback I got previously when I asked was people don't like the IPSC targets and they like the variety. So not, a, not everything will be IPSC targets or USPSA targets. It'll be a variety of both. Well, all right. <laughs> well, shit, I don't have much to say about that. Yeah, I don't know. Sounds like you're doing a lot of work. So, so doing Area 3 has actually been quite a bit of work. Uh, getting the, so I have a stats person, Andrew from Iowa. He's doing stats. Uh, got an RM picked out, all that. But arranging all the budget, had to create a budget document from scratch. There wasn't anything existing to really to use that made sense for me. And that actually Wait, had aren't you every, doing every, it at the same range with the same sponsors? Yes. But no existing. Not not to the level that I needed it to be at, so I could actually see like all the hard costs and actually what the entry fee needs to be to at least cover the costs. Okay. There was nothing like that out there. So I had to figure out how much the range charges, how much USPSA charges, how much kind of average launch will be, how much trophies would be, how much to give the ROs to work the match, and then actually change and have a couple different scenarios about how many people actually shot it, would shoot it and pay for the match. So I could actually come up with a budget number to put as the match entry fee. Once that got up there, we got that out. We I kind of have a pretty good idea of how many people are going to attend now and how many are paid for slots and how many are comped. It's looking like we'll have probably 350 plus shooters shoot the match. Uh, we're, what are we? We're like two weeks from registration opening and we have 300 over 300 people registered for the match at this point. So I think that's pretty good. Uh, I believe last year they only had 350 total people shoot it. So we'll see how it does compared to previous years and the feedback that we get from it. So it, I'm looking forward to it. But it's not going to be, you're not doing the same thing, obviously. This has been done nope. the last decade or whatever. No, I've made it clear that it's not going to be the same stages as, as previous Area 3s. All right. Cool. Well, Frank, what do you want to talk about? 318 shooters as of this podcast. Okay. <laughs> I'm very happy for you. Thanks. So that's that's funny because I actually wanted to talk about um, what it takes to put on a major match. So that's a, that's a perfect segue, segue into uh, what I wanted to uh, discuss. Are we talking about your sectional where you run it between two clubs now? That's correct. All right. Let's talk about it. So, um, so just to give people uh, an idea of what's involved in running a match like this, uh, uh, a level two match or above, you know, um, a couple. I, I wrote down a few things, you know, like where to start. Number one, uh, the first thing where we started was we had to uh, secure a uh, range master. You know, the range master uh, is probably one of the most important people, if not the most important guy there. Uh, he's going to be running the show the day of the match. You know, people, a lot of people I don't think realize the match director, once the match starts, really doesn't do anything. You know, runs around I, empty and trash cans and stuff like pretty that. Pretty much. <laughs> that's pretty much it. And I try not to even do that much, actually. Yeah. Once the day of the match comes, I'm done. I'm there to, to watch the show. So, but the range master is super important. And uh, to have a local range master is actually also very helpful. You know, if you have one available, uh, we happen to have a, a local range master instructor. Uh, it's local to us, George. Um, I've already talked to him probably about three or four different times. Every time something comes up, I give him a call. Uh, so, you know, the range master, again, it's super important. you got to make sure you have an adequate facility, uh, adequate, you know, restrooms, you know, for example. Uh, uh, parking for the, uh, the shooters. So that's one of the things we're working on now. Last year, uh, we got uh, a parking situation at our club and, the other club was uh, it was a little tight, a little hectic. So I decided this year, you know, we're gonna have all the staff park outside the uh, outside the club, you know, on the street and park away from the facility, so we leave more room for our, our shooters. You know, and then uh, 
from there we get into the staff. You know, you can't put on these matches unless you have a staff to run uh, the match. You know, each stage you're going to run, you figure out how many stages you're going to have. We're going to be doing 10 stages. Um, five at my club, five at the club down the road from us, Richmond Borough. Uh, you're going to need a minimum, I would say, of three ROs to run each stage. And you need a CRO in there also. You know, for a level two match, I don't think it's as critical to have a certified CRO, but everyone has to be certified ROs. So you got to make sure you have adequate staff. You need a stats guy, we need a quartermaster. You know, the uh, Mr. Fix-It, the guy that's running around constantly getting uh, targets, getting sticks, fixing things that break. You know, uh, we found out last year the quartermasters were super important. You know, they need to know what they're doing. Something breaks, you need to get it up and running quick. You can't have shooters standing around doing nothing. You're going to totally screw up the whole match. So, you know, all this, these staff to get all these people involved and coordinate everybody together, again, really important. You know, and uh, Matt, you already talked about stages. So, you know, that's that's the least of the problems when it comes to coordinating the whole match and getting everything on the ground. You know, and then uh, uh, sponsors. That's another thing. You know, you're going to have sponsors for the match. You know, you announce the match. You put it out there. These people don't come to you. Say, hey, we want to sponsor your match. It doesn't work like that, I found out. <laughs> you actually have to seek out sponsors, talk to people, talk to different companies, people that you want to get involved in your match. You know, there are a lot of great companies out there, a lot of people that uh, that are willing to help out, donate. They donate prizes, they want gift certificates, stuff like that. You know, so it's, it's you got to reach out to these people. It's the only way it's going to happen. You know, and then it comes, then you have to coordinate staff day, which is a total freaking nightmare. Last year, our staff day, uh, we didn't get done shooting. Uh, we started about nine in the morning. We didn't finish till after seven at night. You know, by the end of the day, everyone was like, Fuck, man, if tomorrow's like this, we're all screwed. <laughs> but, you know, we had, a, we had a lot of moving targets, and we had a lot of stuff that uh, I never did before that I put in there, uh, and I learned from my mistake. I will never do that again. I'll make sure, uh, you know, I put stuff in there, you know, moving targets and activated and stuff like that that I know I've used before and stuff that works. So we I got all the kinks worked out on staff day, which led to a very smooth match day, which is what you want. Bottom line is all this goes into, you know, making the match day work smooth. So our match uh, is, uh, is going to be in June, first weekend in June. Uh, we put it out there. We opened up the registration. Within a couple of days, the match was sold out. So as of right now, we have almost 180 people registered for a one-day match. Oh, holy shit. Yeah. That, yeah. That's I, awesome. I was, I was in shock at, at the response that we got. You know, uh, you know, that's uh, that's staff, staff shooting on staff day and the actual day. So I probably got about a dozen people, you know, on the wait list right now. Um, and then we got some sponsored shooters coming. Some of the sponsored shooters from Ruger are coming down. You know, uh, some GMs are coming down to, to shoot the match. So, you know, it, it should be great. You know, I'm really looking forward to it. But it's I don't think people realize the amount of work that goes into putting a match like this on the ground, even a level two match. You know, I know it's not an area championship, but I mean, man, it's a lot of work. You know, and the average shooter doesn't get to see all this. You know, they just show up, you know, they get the stuff, they go shoot, have a good time. Hopefully everything works out. But uh, they never get to see everything that goes into putting a match like this on the ground and getting it done and the months and months of work. You know, it is literally every couple of days I'm doing something to work on this match. Whether I'm talking to sponsors, you know, talking to, you know, the crew that I got working with me, talking to the other match director from... Uh, Richmond Borough, the other club, Jerry. So, you know, it's a lot of work. So, but it's worth it in the end. I enjoy it. You know, we don't, uh, we don't get, really don't get anything out of it. Besides, you know, putting a great stage, uh, you know, putting great stages on the ground, putting a great match together for the shooters. This is that like was the... one thing that I had to figure out was how to budget in the RM travel. So, we're we're flying the RM in, and he's gonna have to rent a car. So having to figure out kind of budget that into the match also, right. and then the hotels for them. So just getting all the accommodations for everything figured out also. That's a big big task. Yeah, I haven't right. even tackled the awards yet, so I'm gonna have to contact someone hopefully up in Grand Island, Nebraska, that can do the awards, and I can just pick them up there and not have to transport them up from Kansas City. 
Yeah, I didn't even get that far yet. But yeah, that's why I say if you don't have a local range master, that would be really helpful. So we don't have to worry about flying him in. We don't have to worry about, you know, renting him a car. You know, we just got to put him up for a couple of days. You know, this way yeah, he's close nice. to the range. Yeah. So again, that's, that's really super helpful. This is a very positive topic, uh, topics, guys. Well, I have another. To- I have a topic, but it's not really very spicy. Hope that's it's okay. okay. It doesn't have to be. You know. Yeah. I. I thought you'd. I thought you'd think so. So uh, I went and did a a week long thing at uh, at Camp Pendleton with the, the Marine Corps shooting team, which was it was interesting to train with those guys for a week. And they were not experienced USPSA shooters. So what I what I thought it'd be fun to talk about was adapting. USPSA style drills to their their equipment and their uh, targets that they had because their targets were a little bit different than USPSA targets. So like one drill to use it as an example was the build drill. So normally a decent build drill, what, two seconds, right? At seven yards. If you can, you know, consistently draw and shoot six A's at seven yards in like two seconds or less, that's all right. That's pretty good. You know, depending on how quick your finger is. Uh, I think that's actually probably pretty high. I think it's like two and a half is a more standard bar for that, right? I mean, I don't I don't think so, but <laughs> you got different levels of people now, remember? There are different levels of people. Yeah. But I yes. mean a slowly B shoot is, you know, can't do it in yeah, two there seconds. We go. Yes, be, not for B-shooters, but for, <laughs> yes, for like a switched-on master class guy. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. For somebody who's, you know, not as good as that, yes, two and a half. So, anyway, uh, to adapt that drill for this crew of guys, my the time I gave them to, to train on was two and a half seconds. Because, you know, they were using a retention holster, then an M18, which is like a SIG 320 with... Uh, the trigger is pretty stiff on that. I'm not going to lie. Um, retention holster that, and then uh, pretty hard, you know, 115 grain ball ammo, and then the target was a little bit tighter than in A zone. So, you know, adding all that up, the time standard I laid down was two and a half seconds. It was interesting to like put that out there and have the guys train on it and try and do it. Um, you know, the same as I would have like a civilian class do try to, you know, do it in two seconds. If that's, if that's what we're working on. Did you notice some of the same problems or issues come up? Yes, absolutely. Across the competition shooter only. And then the the military guys. Yeah, actually just, it was just more so with the military guys because they're just less experienced with handguns. Like this particular group of military guys. As you know, there's there's different units I might go to, but this group not very experienced with handguns, and then you've got like a, a stiff trigger and then pretty hot ammo. So there's no, you know, there's really no advantage built into the equipment. So it start you start seeing a lot of problems fast, as okay. opposed to a guy with a a raced out trigger with light ammo. Yeah. So the tr- the trigger masks a lot of problems, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so one pound trigger can uh, can compensate for a lot of less than desirable. Yeah, you'll skills. still have the same problem. You just need to be further away to really see it express right. itself the same way. Yeah. So what yeah. else did you do besides the build drill with them? Oh, we did like El Presidente. We did distance change ups. Uh, four aces. So can we assume that they weren't training for competition and they were just out there having fun? No, this was in, this was like a like a, it, like an advanced marksmanship development thing, like instructor development. This was their instructors, yeah. or okay. So did they think it made sense, and it, could they translate it over? Yeah, absolutely. It was just very opposite to what you know, I, you know, traditional training. Where it was, um, I mean, that was really the core concept I was laying down was uh, using timers and giving yourself, hey, you have permission to make mistakes, you know, because that's going to happen when you're pushing speed. So, like, you kind of 
get them prepared to accept that and then lay down, you know, par times and have them work within a time limit to achieve goals, but, you know, allow for them to fail a lot. That's good. So they were able to take your training, which came from competition based, and they were able to see how it could be adapted over to how they're training for their purpose. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. So, All right. So this was competition training. Uh, I mean, it's marksmanship training. Okay. <laughs> I mean, so and you, and you said these guys weren't really handgun guys, right? No. So no, so really. so you get guys that aren't uh, aren't really handgun guys, and you're doing this type of training. Where do you start with them? Uh, like, you start with grip, man. <laughs> like this is so how right you right from the beginning. And... <laughs> yeah. You start you start with that. Do a lot of repetition. And then go from there. I mean, they they were, <coughs> excuse me. I mean, they were safe and everything. There wasn't any any issues like that. It was just they weren't like action like action shooters. Right. Could, so in the class, I kind of went and watched you teach. You kind of skipped over and didn't talk about those fundamentals like grip and stance and all that. Do you think on this class you did with them, you had to kind of revert back and and teach those type of things? Yeah, but I do it in a weird way. I I don't do it in a in like the conventional order, but yeah. Did talk about that stuff. For sure. All right, awesome. But it's good. It's interesting adapting that material for different groups. That's good. So they're going to take that training and back to all okay. the Marines or people that they teach and then they're going to Hopefully incorporate it and make better shooters. If it makes right? them better. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's the idea. Awesome. All right. Let's take a question. This one's kind of wonky. So I mean, you may not have a strong re reaction, but it's, I thought it was, it's kind of wonky. So I want to read it. Um, could this be a viable setup for USPSA? In different sports, different levels of skill play by different rules. For example, college ba basketball has a three-pointer that's closer to the rim than in the nba they also play in 10-minute quarters instead of 12 and used to play 20-minute halves without any quarters my thought would be to have a tier setup of skill you would still retain all divisions in each tier but for instance you could keep the current production rules for that entry level tier and as you move up you increase the limitation on things like weights magnet placement etc you would only compete against others in your same skill tier. And when it comes to events like nationals, only top tier shooters would be able to attend. <laughs> Just like we don't have college football players competing against NFL teams. Uh, they don't get to go to the Super Bowl. Like, okay. <laughs> I so, would, it's pretty off the wall question. I it's thought. off the wall, but it's it's sort of relevant. It's the so ever since I made my presidential platform out there and won big nationals, the number one question was, "What are you going to do about slots? How many slots are going to be there?" So people think that one big nationals at the end of the year. When I said that was, it'd be the same size of the current nationals, which it wouldn't be. It would be expanded by almost double for the main match. And then people were worried about how slots would be earned for that. And the president doesn't determine how the slots are awarded for nationals. That's a board of directors policy. So even if any president that came in there that said that, they don't they only want M's and GMs or whatever to shoot the nationals. They can't make that policy. That's not a thing. Wait, and so you're saying you want only M's and GMs to shoot nationals? No, I don't. I've never said that ever. What? I've never said that. It's oh. some rumor someone's out someone's putting out there to try. So you to don't believe that. It. Huh? You don't believe that. Even I if don't you've never believe. Said it. Huh? I don't know. You gotta be real specific sometimes. I do not believe that M's and GMs should be the only ones that should be shooting nationals. I think it should be open to all classes. Can it Maybe be more clear lying. than that? No, I mean <laughs> <laughs> okay so that was just his last sentence in that whole question right 
I thought I've never even heard of the idea of like changing the equipment rules with your skill level. That was so that's wild. <laughs> I mean, they're not changing the size. As of the course. So it'd be like changing stages based on a level one, level two, level three, or in nationals, versus actually changing the equipment rules. No, so but he's the same. I'm reading this as like once you move up in class, it changes the like it restricts your equipment more. It makes no sense. <laughs> Honestly, it makes no sense. Told you Which out. I think I'm... he's not looking at it right. Like. Well, he's looking, he's at, looking it very at it different from other people. That's for sure. So he's comparing the size of a basketball court to a person's gun, which actually in comparison to USPSA, that it would be the basketball court would be equivalent to a stage. And then the basketball itself would be equivalent to the guns. Right. <laughs> so he's looking at it wrong. Yeah, he's trying to compare apples and oranges. You can't, com yeah. you can't compare the two. <laughs> a correlation that we always kind of get shit on when we talk about is golf, right? <laughs> <laughs> golf has the same requirements no matter your handicap based on number of clubs and all the different requirements for clubs. That's a personal competitor equipment. But they have different tee boxes on each, uh, what do you call it, hole? Right. Based on your skill level or category. <laughs> your well, category. Well, well, based on your skill level, you're shooting against whoever your class is. You know, if I'm yes. a B class shooter, I'm shooting against other B class shooters. That's yeah. that's that's just, that's exactly what it comes down to. So yeah. I, I think this yeah. guy is trying to look for for a way to revert some of the changes that, that's happened based on what matches it's at yeah and that, that, that's what it sounded like to me my original impression was you know when it comes to like the, uh, the flashlight rule and that nonsense you know but yeah the equipment changes you know maybe we should, that should be at a different level as you move up a level we eliminate that you know almost like a level one exemption have an exemption for that stuff yeah you know, but it'd level. be reverse it'd right. be reverse It'd be like a level two restriction and then a level three restriction. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I knew that was a wonky question. <laughs> so I don't know if I want to go deep down in this hole, but honestly, the, the flashlights, the magnets, the holster replacement, that's all been voted in for a year. Can we, is it perfect no. Did the members well, actually want it? No. It's but done. We're stuck it's, with it. it's done. It's done. We need it's to done. we need to move on from that at this point. I still like make fun of it sometimes though. Man. Yeah, but it's, I can't help myself. The board did fix that so that doesn't happen in the future. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> as long as they follow the new bylaws. <laughs> All right. Well, this is a great time to end it. So, uh, well, listeners, if you have a question you'd like the answer to, especially if it's a wonky one, I like those. Go to bensticker.com, send me a question. We would love to hear from you.